In our last installment, we asked the question, has CRT entered K through 12 schools in Texas? And then we answered, yes, it has. We used the UT hosted teacher resource called Teaching Texas Slavery to demonstrate. The website for that project offered very little in the way of slavery history and focused instead on race and critical race theory. One of the leads on that project was Dr. Dinah Berry. She's also a co-creator of the site we're reviewing today. Joining Dr. Berry on this project was UT archivist, Rachel Winston. And funding for the work we're looking at today was provided by a 2016 grant from the Humanities Media Project at UT. Here's what's on the Humanities Media Project website regarding the grant. It's quite lengthy and we'll link to the website so you can read it in full, but here's a summary. They tell us twice that it's an interdisciplinary team researching and mapping the slave trade in Texas and other parts of the Americas. Research efforts culminated in a trip to the southeastern coast of Texas, including visits to the cities of Matagorda, Wharton, Bay City, and Palacios, where the team visited museums and libraries as well as cemeteries and other sites of significance. Grant funds were used to purchase research materials and technical supplies, employ graduate student researchers, and finance the research trip. The information collected and analysis produced throughout the entire grant period was used to generate the content of a project website designed to provide insight into slave life and slave trade routes in this region. And here is the website, the Texas Domestic Slave Trade Project. The site is hosted by the University of Texas. On the site, they describe their team as follows, quote, an interdisciplinary team of scholars, historians, and archivists at the University of Texas at Austin. Combined, we have more than three decades of archival experience and each contribute a range of specializations to this project. From issues of gender, race relations, and border crossings to pedagogy, public scholarship, and oral history, our team represents myriad interests, strengths, and perspectives that have proved immeasurably useful throughout this project, end quote. Dr. Berry and Ms. Winston are highly educated and accomplished women, and they seem to be backed by a large Longhorn team. So let's see what they can teach us. On the UT-hosted website, they describe their project thus, quote, the website offers a digital visual history of Matagorda County by photographing archival documents and historical sites in the region, end quote. By documenting history through written text, cultural remnants, and intangible memories, conversations, and reflections, the researchers involved in this study constantly commit themselves to pushing the boundaries of what is knowable through various historical records. Ultimately, then, this website illuminates the lasting legacy of slavery in the region and provides valuable information available to historians, researchers, and students, end quote. I'll point out up front that the quality of writing on the site isn't what you'd expect from such well-educated women or even grad-level students, especially on a public-facing site. But does the site deliver what it says it does? Did the Humanities Media Project at UT who funded the venture get their money's worth? Did the research team really document Matagorda by photographing archival documents and historical sites? Let's get into it. On the homepage is a photo taken down up here. Quote, from this perspective, it is possible to see the flatness of the land, which corroborates historical documents highlighting both the richness of the soil and the destructive capacities of hurricanes and tropical storms, end quote. So how does the flatness of the land corroborate soil richness exactly? Not all flat land is akin to alluvial soil found in Matagorda. Just ask much of the coastal bend. And I don't really know what the capacity of hurricanes has to do with anything, but okay. And now we have our first map sighting. The 1835 Bradford map of Texas does show Matagorda. Unfortunately, the image isn't clickable and cannot be enlarged, so users will just have to imagine the geography of 1835 Texas. Also on the homepage is an image of Mr. Clifford Rugley standing beside a historical marker at the St. Pilgrim Baptist Church. So far, not so good. Now, under the landscape section, we have an image of a letter from Juan Cortez regarding a trip to Matagorda. Can't click to enlarge it. It's in Spanish, obviously, but no translation is offered, just a single sentence summary. There's also an image of an ad for the Bozeman Slave Depot in New Orleans, which can't be enlarged. They're loosely related to the text of this page, 
which gives a thumbnail sketch of settlement in Matagorda, waterways, and some early churches. Under landscape, then buildings, we have two images of the historic Dale Rugley Sisk House. There is no mention of this house anywhere on the site or how it or its previous owners relate to slavery. The left-hand image was snapped during the team's 2016 field trip. It gives the text of the historical marker at the home site. The other is a photo taken on the field trip, a photo of a photocopy of a photograph the site claims was used when, quote, the Matagorda Historical Society petitioned to buy the property and maintain its furnishings as representative of the county's rich history, end quote. Um, no. The original 1964 photograph accompanied the application for a Texas historical marker. Incidentally, the house is now on the market for $200,000 if anybody out there is interested. We're next treated to some courthouse history. An image of the 1840s courthouse is at the left. An image of the 1896 courthouse is at the right. The text tells us, quote, Located in the town square, the courthouse has been remodeled a number of times, reflecting contemporary architecture and growing local needs with every new iteration, end quote. While it is true that the 1896 courthouse was remodeled in the 1920s, it's impossible to be present in the Matagorda County Courthouse, as the researchers absolutely were, and not understand it's a modern building. The current courthouse is a 1960s brutalist atrocity with concrete construction and underground parking. But hey, why bother with accuracy in presenting information, though? Under the Agriculture tab of the Landscape section, we find a photo of the framed 1839 Selkirk map of Matagorda that's in the GLO collection. You can't zoom on it, there's no close-up, just a photo of a map on a wall, on a site that claims it will map the domestic slave trade routes of Southeast Texas. The 1839 Selkirk map in all its detailed splendor is available online. Here's a close-up of 1839 Matagorda since our scholars didn't see fit to provide us with one. The text of this section caught my attention. Quote, those who settled the area in the 1820s were mostly farmers and stock raisers. Although few intended to do the laborious work of profiting off the land alone. Indeed, from its founding until the Civil War, Matagorda was built almost exclusively on the labor of enslaved individuals, end quote. That's a heck of a sweeping statement to make, particularly since two sentences later they say, quote, Roughly one-third of agricultural families who arrived in the area in the 1820s through the next two decades owned enslaved laborers, end quote. So it seems to me about two-thirds intended to do the laborious work of profiting off the land themselves, and Matagorda wasn't built almost exclusively on slave labor. The stats you provide don't match your claims. Also, why is stock raisers in scare quotes? That was an actual term for people who actually raised livestock. It still is. A 2016 photo of Caney Creek taken from the Mount Pilgrim Church is captioned in part, quote, baptisms in the creek continue into the present, end quote. I'm not sure what that has to do with the agriculture section we're in. So let's consult the text next to it. Quote, the waterways that crossed through the county served to not only irrigate the soil, but to also transport harvested crops to other cities across the South. Most notably, Caney Creek, mark the livelihood of many who lived in the region. Within this context, Caney Creek baptisms were a staple of said livelihood for both enslaved laborers and their enslavers. Many of the churches that developed alongside the waterway relied on the symbolic meanings of water to the Christian faith to sustain and nourish their parishioners' religiosity, end quote. So because the creek used for baptisms also irrigated crops, baptisms were a staple of people's livelihoods? Say again? And churches located near water relied on symbolic meanings of water to sustain religiosity? Have we mapped anything yet, guys? No, no, we haven't. So let's hop over to the seascape section and see what we find there. A photo of the jetty at the mouth of the Colorado River is captioned, quote, Contemporary view of where the Gulf of Mexico and Colorado River meet, visualizing the movement of the water, the breadth of the waterways, and the height of the tide contribute to the larger history of how slavery actually happened, particularly in Matagorda, end quote. 
So had you said seeing the waterways and land helped us visualize where slaves once lived, I would buy that. There's a certain feeling you get when you visit a place where important things happened. But saying that seeing the movement of water and the height of a tide contribute to the history of how slavery actually happened is just absurd. Your feelings aren't history. And had you looked into the history of the area and the waterways you keep referencing, you would know that this view of the mouth of the Colorado doesn't resemble what anyone saw in the 19th century. Allow me to provide you some context. The Colorado River around Matagorda was very slow moving. This allowed rafts or log jams to form and clog it up. The raft in the 1830s grew upstream so badly that the Colorado was only navigable for like 10 miles above its mouth. That was the state of things for nearly three decades. In 1858, draining and navigation were so badly impaired that the Army Corps of Engineers channeled around the log jam. But during the Civil War, even the channel backed up with logs because the Army Corps of Engineers wasn't there to maintain it. At its peak, the log jam was 45 miles long and had trees growing on top of it. The delta that we see today is the result of 20th century removal of the jam. Then the rapidly forming new delta deposits caused the former seaside town of Matagorda to sort of become landlocked. While we're on Matagorda waterways and how slavery actually happened, our multidisciplinary team might want to look at the Kate Ward Chute. In the early 1850s, William Ward, along with his steamboat, the Kate Ward, and up to 30 slaves hired out from local planners, spent a couple of years chipping away at that raft at the behest of the Colorado Navigation Company. The portion they succeeded in opening was called the Kate Ward Chute and still is to this day. Now let's get into the seascape section of the site. Quote, History tells us that more than fish attracted a wide variety of people to this area. In fact, Early 19th century visitors claimed that there was no healthier region in the world because of the alluvial soil and proximity to water, end quote. In fact, no healthier region was a hyperbolic but commonly used phrase to describe coastal areas in the 19th century. In fact, it wasn't an early 19th century visitor, but a mid 19th century Matagorda resident, Don Brahman, who wrote in his 1857 book, Brahman's information about Texas that it was the healthiest region in the world because folks could benefit from sea breezes and saltwater soaks, not alluvial soil. Now our professor, archivist, and team tell us about, quote, the enslaved people on James W. Stewart's ship, the St. Paul. This schooner carried goods that included 58 human cargo from New Orleans to Matagorda County in December 1846, end quote. They say that in 1850, Stewart's, quote, real estate was valued at $20,000. Although precisely how much of that wealth was based on his enslaved property remains unknown, the fact that 20 of the 58 individuals he transported to Matagorda were 10 years old or younger suggests he was interested in building a long-term labor force that would continue to generate income for years to come. For starters, it likely wasn't Stewart's ship, just because he shipped people on it doesn't make it his ship. The St. Paul was a commercial schooner. The Slave Manifest gives the shipment at 60 souls, not 58. I count 70 on the list plus three infants, so who knows. Stewart's real estate in 1850 was not valued at $20,000. His nearest neighbor's real estate was valued at $20,000. Stewart's was valued at 3600 Our scholars say it's unknown precisely how much of that amount was tied up in slaves. Ah, but it is known. The answer is zero. Slaves were not considered real property, i.e. land and improvements. They would have been Stewart's personal property. Real estate is fixed. Personal property is movable. Stewart owned 35 slaves in September 1850. On the New Orleans Shipping Manifest, he isn't listed as the owner of the human cargo. He's just the shipper. He was present at New Orleans to ship them. Were they shipped for a particular buyer back in Matagorda? Were some of them Stuarts? We don't know. The image immediately below the St. Paul saga contains an ad for a slave woman for sale in Columbia, Texas. The caption reads in part, quote, like the enslaved individuals on the St. Paul, the experience of this unnamed woman must be imagined by reading between the lines, end quote. Thus adding nothing whatsoever to our knowledge about slavery in Matagorda. 
Final images in this section include an 1858 announcement for the building of the Siluria Lighthouse and a 1982 image taken from space meant to show, quote, the vastness of water in the area, end quote. Thus adding, again, nothing to our knowledge about the slave trade. The next section on the website is escape, landscape, seascape, escape, get it? Anyway, we're presented with some verbiage about, quote, most enslaved men and women had one trait in common, they sought to be free, end quote. This is mind reading, of course. We have no way to know what millions of people thought or felt or wanted. We are presented with yet another image of Caney Creek. Then we see the face of Ben Kinchlow in an image taken from the WPA Slave Narrative Project collection at the Library of Congress. Ben's story is familiar to those of us who have read the Texas former slave narratives in the collection. But Dr. Barry and Miss Winston tell it a little differently than Ben did. Quote, In 1847, for example, Lazare Moore escaped from South Texas and made her way to Mexico with her one-year-old son, Ben Kinchlow, in tow. Ben and his mother lived freely in Matamoros, Mexico until the late 1870s. Around that time, Ben decided to return to the United States, perhaps because slavery had legally ended, end quote. I guess a true escape story from Matagorda was too hard to find, so they just modified Ben's story, which he told like this. After I was born and was one year old, my mother was set free and sent to Mexico to live. When we left Wharton, we were sent away in an ambulance. It was what they called an ambulance, a four-wheeled concern pulled by two mules. The big, rich white folks would get in and go to church or on a long journey. His mother had the means to live on till she got there and got acquainted. We stayed there about 12 years, then moved back to Brownsville and stayed there until all the Negroes were free, end quote. His mother was freed with her two children and given safe transport and money to reach Matamoros. Such a hair-raising tale of escape. Entirely manufactured by the brilliant minds at UT. And somehow it gets more absurd in the following paragraph about failed escapes. Hold on to your hats. Quote, attempting to disrupt that system through running away could have physical ramifications if caught. In 1869, for example, Susan Randall's mark of a smooth crop off right ear split in left, along with a curly number 23, appear in the first volume of the Matagorda County Brand Book. Similarly, John Harrison has marks for hogs and cattle explained by the under part of each ear sloped off. The initials J-O-N are also identified as part of his brand. How did these two individuals come to be branded? Who branded them? How did they understand these marks, particularly the numbers and initials, as they also likely saw them on animals? Did either try to run away? These kinds of questions hit hard at the daily experience of being enslaved in the Matagorda region. Thus, the question becomes, why did enslavers brand their human chattel? So you heard the date, right? 1869. And you know the Civil War ended in 1865. And you also heard marks for hogs and cattle, right? So it would seem that our professional archivist and professor understand what a brand book is. But okay, so anyway, you'll note our team that went into the field to take photos to present a digital visual history by photographing archival documents do not illustrate their absurdity with images of any documents. So to give them the benefit of the doubt, I went to Matagorda to the county courthouse and I located these marks in the brand book. And somehow I managed to pull it off without an interdisciplinary team or fistfuls of grant money. Here's the entry for Susan Randall, clearly noted as a freed woman. Her mark and brand are as noted by our scholars. And here's the mark and brand for John Harrison, clearly noted as a freed man. The little illustration of bovine ears should have been a clue that these two individuals owned property that bore their marks in 1869 when they were free. The fact that there are plenty of Anglos whose brands and marks are recorded in the same book in the exact same way should have been a bigger clue. And yet Dr. Berry and Miss Winston ask, either out of ignorance or out of deceit, 
How did these two individuals come to be branded? Who branded them? And this is what's passing for scholarship at UT. A few photos of Caney Creek, some screenshots from online repositories, and a weak historical narrative are not a digital history of slavery in Matagorda. And using a couple of tiny photos of maps on your website does not constitute mapping the slave trade routes in southeastern Texas. And since this sloppy work went live in 2016, you may be wondering what became of Dr. Dinah Berry and archivist Rachel Winston. Are they still employed? Well, Dr. Berry is now the chair of the history department at the University of Texas. She's in charge of recruiting new history faculty, determining who teaches what to whom, what grad students get assigned to what advisors, and so much more. And no, I'm not joking. Huge on critical race theory, too. Rachel Winston is the first black diaspora archivist at UT. In a recent interview with Sightlines Magazine, she very openly said she uses archives for activism, that archivists do much more than process papers now, that archivists are not unbiased and archives themselves are political by their very nature. This summer, she contributed a piece called Praxis for the People to an MIT essay collection called Knowledge Justice on critical race theory in libraries. And in May 2021, she gave a CRT presentation to an Association of College and Research Libraries webinar on integrating primary sources and critical race theory in teaching. So we needn't wonder why the history in this project is so glaringly absent, and when it's there, is so sloppy. Race is their thing, not history. What we need to wonder is what the UT Board of Regents is going to do about people they've put in such high places who get so much wrong. The folks in our universities have gone too long without scrutiny, trying to rewrite history in their own image based on their feelings and ideology. The best thing you can do is share this video. Join me in spreading the scrutiny around. Until next time, God in Texas, y'all. <laughs>